you know, we're obviously on a college campus here. Um, it seems also to, you know, when you're on Mythbusters, right, it's such a perfect fit, almost predestined for you to kind of fit that role. Is that what you're looking to do when you're back in college? I had no idea what I wanted to do when I was in college. I was not, I wouldn't say I was destined to be a Mythbuster. My, my dad would disagree because apparently I used to create a lot of experiments and use my little sister as a crash test dummy. But um, I went to college for film and art and I was trying to get into special effects. And my first job at a special effects house was also the first day they started filming Mythbusters. So I kind of, I, 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 I found an opportunity and jumped on it. I was going to say, what was breaking into M5? Like, how did you get there? <laughs> breaking into M5 Industries was not as hard as you think. Uh, I mostly just offered to work for free, and Jamie Heineman is extremely thrifty. And he's like, great. I think uh, my first few tasks were sharpening old screws and straightening them out because we could reuse them. Um, <laughs> organizing the shop, taking out the trash, worked my way up. You know, after all your years on Mythbusters, I'm sure you've gone through a lot, right? What would be, would you say, the craziest situation that you could kind of MacGyver yourself out of after all that experience? Man, um, so Mythbusters has prepared me for a life of nothing else other than to possibly be a TV host or maybe a secret agent. I just, there's, there's so many weird skills I have. I mean, I could wire explosives, um, I can build a lot of things, but I, I'm really bad at typing. Like, I really could not have a desk job. It's totally screwed me up. But um, <laughs> it's also made me very good at getting out of any situation. I keep duct tape generally in, in my purse. Um, I have fixed, you know, chains on a tire going down downhill that have broken. Um, I, I carry a multi-tool everywhere I go just in case something breaks. But generally, I'm a good person to have around if there was a zombie apocalypse. I'm fascinated too by kind of like the changing landscape of media that we have. Um, we certainly talk about that in TV news, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but you see some new people now, like Simone Yates, for example, um, do their thing kind of on YouTube. Um, since you know we've seen MythBusters and kind of in the last you know decade or so, um, how has that kind of media engagement changed with you know kind of educational content like that? Well, when MythBusters started, it was the wild west of television. I mean, it was the beginning of cable doing reality television and you just had a few stations you had your cable stations and generally on those cable stations was like animal documentaries so it was the beginning of discovery channel taking a big chance on shows like deadliest catch and mythbusters and dirty jobs and you know i didn't think anybody was ever going to watch this goofy little show we didn't even know it was educational or science we just knew that the perfect narrative vehicle for busting myths was the scientific method and that kind of brought us into a very critical thinking show that started to be used uh, in classrooms. Like we used clips to explain physics principles or scientific method or just critical thinking in general. And it was sort of a catalyst moment for me to realize that I was doing science as an artist. I guess I put the A in STEAM instead of STEM because I didn't know I was doing science. I mean, I was just having a really good time, and I just had that aha moment where when I started approaching science like art and getting my hands dirty, um, it became a whole new thing, and I suddenly saw myself as a person in science. Um, that kicked off about 10 years of being sort of a science communicator um, on Mythbusters. And then as the years have gone by, I've seen an incredible shift. Like Cable TV, t television's basically done. C it's, it's done. The new frontier, the new Wild West is the internet and YouTube and Instagram and TikTok and all the different ways that people are creating bite-sized content. Um, and personally, the way that I would like to evolve with the new platforms um, is I am now a founder of a streaming platform that does short content, like, you know, nothing over 10 minutes, generally about three to six minutes, that's inspiring, and 70% uh, of it is STEM, and they are all videos that are streamed into the classroom or the living room that come with a curriculum that is standard aligned, so that we can actually use clips like we did on Mythbusters in the classroom, but it also makes teachers' jobs a little easier because it comes with discussion plans to help utilize those clips. So though I do not have an amazing TikTok 
feed like a Cleo Abrams or Simone or Ali Ward. Um, I'm I'm more on the production side, trying to create a whole new Discovery Channel, but it's called Explore. Do you see that both in the classroom and at home? Is well, it's, crossover? it's family friendly, so I mean, education happens all over the place. Uh, a lot of education happens um, by educators in after school programs, in the classroom, home school, maybe you're just watching something with your parents, but I, I think that there's a lot of ways that we can meet kids today and inspire them into learning and STEM and empathy and cultural goals and history, algebra, whatever, we can, it's, it's better to meet them where they're at, which is generally social media, short content. Um, so I understand you're also coming off the heels of this national STEM competition. <laughs> How's that been going? I wrote a lot of checks that I had to cash when I pitched doing the national STEM festival. Basically in about, I think it was 20, 14-ish, um, I hosted the White House Science Fair with Bill Nye, and it was a pivotal moment for me. I was so inspired by kids having this moment where they were seen, and I feel like it pushed the trajectory of their life to find a STEM career. They brought their projects from all over the country, and they showed them to the president, and it made them feel so special. And they went on to be leaders, um, and you know, just industry leaders, and politicians, and policy makers, and that science fair stopped there. There hadn't been a science fair, like a national science fair, hadn't happened for over a decade, for one reason or another. Um, you know, it was a different administration, and then it was COVID, and then it just, you know, people hadn't heard of it anymore. But I wanted it back, so I had the luck of meeting the Secretary of Education. I was interviewing him at South by Southwest, and just like, dude, what happened to the science fair? Why are we not bringing this back? And then I became a complete stalker and uh, contacted his administration continually for about a year until I saw him again at the next South by Southwest. And he's like, yes, science fair. I think he just said this to get, get me off his back, but he's just like, yeah, we're talking about it, we're talking about it. I'm like, listen, if you give me the keys, I will build this kingdom for you. And then he said, yes, and I went, <laughs> Luckily, because I'm a part of Explore, and my partner Jenny Bucos is a total pro at educational content and loves creating inspiring things, we decided we were going to take and run with this idea, create the National STEM Festival. We were going to make it more than just a one-time event. We're going to make it much bigger and wider reaching. We're going to get kids from everywhere in the country, including the territories and the BIE and the DOD schools, kids from everywhere, make it as inclusive as possible, find all of the geographic diversity we can, bring all those kids to Washington, D.C. so that they can show their projects, but then also create 365 days of STEM content around the National STEM Festival, um, and that will be continuing on Explore free of charge in the classrooms for people to check out, because we want to we celebrate and elevate STEM, and these young innovators they're not future leaders, they are leaders now. They have patent-ready projects that would blow your mind. And beyond just this incredible festival, I really feel like we've created a ripple effect that has just inspired a lot of kids to go, oh, I could do that too. So for me, this is, this is my new dream. So I deal a lot with politicians, policymakers. Um, I'm fascinated by this idea of like, what can we do broadly as a society to bolster STEM education, also women in STEM too. Um, I mean, I think as long as we're celebrating and realizing that this is a collaboration and our STEM community is strong and you gotta give back. Mythbusters opened a lot of doors for me and it's my turn to hold that door open for a lot of others. and. With the National STEM Challenge and Festival, I worked really, really hard to make sure all of the stakeholders and the voices would be in the room and at the table. Um, we had kids fly in from as far as Guam and American Samoa. We had kids coming in from reservations in Alaska, from urban and rural and inner city. I mean, we just tried really, really hard to make sure that everybody who wanted to come got a chance to be there.